All right. Good morning, everybody. This is morning, morning. 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 Bible Fellowship Church, and uh, today is April 9th. Uh, today is Palm Sunday, so we're going to focus our message on uh, Palm Sunday and a little bit of comparison to some of the things that were happening. Um, <clears throat> We always start our service off with uh, words of praise or words of prayer. And uh, yesterday, Rick Hell and I ran into Maybell, and she used to come to church here. Um, and she just uh, asked that everybody keep keep her in prayer uh, on, on what direction God wants to take her life. And hopefully, uh, she'll be back to, to visit with us. But, uh, just keep her in prayer. Okay? Uh, Keep, please keep Jeannie in prayer for her health. She's going through ke her uh, chemo infusions right now. Mm -hmm. uh, keep her in prayer. And uh, also, as always, keep Jermel and Quisha in prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, does anybody else have any prayer requests or any praise? Mm -hmm. And thank, uh, we want to thankful that we have uh, Linda and Rich here today. Yeah, uh, yeah. Here yeah. visiting with us from Michigan. Uh, praise God. Thank you for you coming. Got a Oh, yeah. What's your prayer request? Yeah, uh, pray for us. We have to deal with my son all the time, and he's mentally ill. Mm. He's just awful to deal with. He's just so hostile and uh, untrusting, and you know the whole thing. And we Amen. try to help him, and he, the more we try to help him, the worse he gets. Amen. Amen. And, uh, well, we'll definitely lift you up in prayer there. That God just gives you the patience and the direction on how to deal with him. Uh, we've all gone gone through some stuff with children that uh, makes life difficult sometimes, but uh, God has the answer, believe it or not. He, do, he does have an answer. Okay? okay? Are there any other prayer requests? Israel. Israel? Israel. Okay. All right. All right, so we can bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, Father, just to, to lift up and to praise your name, Lord. To, to read into your doctrines, to read into your scriptures, Father, to seek out guidance for our lives and, and direction. Father, we pray for Jermel and we pray for Israel and Zariah and, and the many children and, and Linda's, Linda's son. Uh, we pray for uh, Jamel and Quisha. Father, we pray that you have your, your hand of protection on them and your, your hand of guidance, Father, and that you would guide them through the difficulties that they're going through and, and, and give them direction, Father. And Father, we pray for the parents that they would have the peace and, and that you would give them instruction on how to deal with the situation, and whether to, whether to intervene, Father, or sometimes just to, to leave it on the throne and to leave it in your hands, Father. It, it, it can be so challenging and difficult, Father. So we, we ask for your, your guidance and your leadership. Uh, and, and Father, above all, Father, give us peace with whatever decisions that we must make. Give us, give us that, that blessed peace, Father, that only you can give us. Father, we ask that you bless the message today. And Father, we ask that you, uh, that you would keep me out of the way, Father, and, and let, let your voice come through. Uh, help me to preach only the truth, Father, and be respectful of, of your word and your scriptures. Father, we lift up your name in the name of Jesus Christ, we, we pray, amen. amen. So as I said, today we celebrate Palm Sunday. So this day we remember Jesus Christ and his triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem. And while I'm going through this, why don't you go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 11. What's the title? The title is The Triumphant Entry. How do you spell triumphant? T-R-I-U-M-P-H-A-N-T. And thank goodness for word check, because I'm one of the worst spellers in the world. <laughs> Entry. <laughs> Entry, E-N-T-R-Y. Mark 11? Mark 11, yep. Yeah. And we're going to be covering verses 1 through 11 at first. Okay, so as I said, we, uh, this day is that Christ entered into Jerusalem. It was full of contrast and comparison. Today, we'll examine Christ's entry and another journey which hundreds of years earlier had foreshadowed this day. And in Mark 11, we read, and it says, I'm reading from the King James, and it says, And when they came nigh to Jerusalem unto Bethage, or Bethphage, 
and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples, and saith unto them, Go your way into the village, over against you. And as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, whereon never man sat. Loose him, and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do, you do, why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. And they went their way, and found the colt tied by the door, without a place where two ways met. And they loose him. And certain of them that stood there sighed unto them, What do, what do ye? Loose the colt. And they said unto them that even as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus, and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees, and strayed them in the way. And they that went before, and they that followed, cried, saying, Hosanna. Blessed is, is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David, that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem, and into the temple, and when he had looked round about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, and he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. <clears throat> now we have a couple of things happening here. And last week, the, the sermon that we preached last week, we were talking about the, the importance of Israel's, uh, the Israel's ministry in that it was a physical ministry. There was much things for them to see. God was revealing things, uh, physical manifestations, and, and, and uh, miracles, wonders, and prophecy. And here we have, we have fulfillment of prophecy. We have that colt sitting there that was prophesied, and, then, and Jesus told them to go there, and, and, and he said, he even told them, if, if somebody says to you, says something, here's what you say. You can let them know. Somebody's going to challenge you on this. Okay, so, so this was much fulfillment of prophecy, and him riding in was, was, was like the coronation. This was where Israel was to accept him as the Messiah, accept him as his king. We were to usher in the kingdom. And here they sit there and they said, this is, this is the son of David. And that goes back to the Davidic uh, covenant, that his son would sit on the throne forever, his bloodline. So you have much uh, uh, fulfillment of prophecy here. Now, where does the church fit in here? They don't. <laughs> not they do not. There wasn't anything prophetic here, any message for the church. This is for Israel and Israel alone. This is God's fulfill. This was God to fulfill their program. So as they, as they rode in, they, they put the palms down, and you know how they, we all do in the churches now, we all get the palms and we wave the palms and we have all that, but um, we have no palms here, by the way. <laughs> well, we still celebrate the fact that, that his entry into Jerusalem is king. Now Christ rides in on the colt, as I said, it was prophesied. Now, and as I said, this was Israel's opportunity to accept their king. Now, the Jews, in accepting Christ as their king, should have taken Christ to the altar and, and binded him to the horns with the cords. This was how they were to accept him. Jesus Christ went. He was, he was going to willingly give up his life to pay for the sins of the world. So, the, the cross was not directly in the plan. Had it went according to God's plan, Israel would have accepted him, they would have taken him, they would have bound him to the cords, and they would have sacrificed him. This was what the plan was. Now this is referenced in Psalms 8, 118, verse 27. And it says, God is the Lord which hath showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. What's the reference, Junior? It's Psalms 118, verse 27. So Israel had asked God through the prophet for an earthly king. You remember when 
when this was set up, they had no king. They had judges. But Israel sought to be like the Gentile nations. They wanted an earthly king. They wanted a king that they could see right now. Because remember, everything with Israel is manifested by <coughs> sight. And we talked about that last week. So they desired a king, and God gave them Saul. Now think about the kings of Israel. How many kings of That's Israel right. can you think of that did not mess up? We're, we're, we're human beings, but I mean they really messed up. <laughs> okay, and as you, as you read through them, they they as soon as they get a decent one in, and he'd be going doing good for a while, then he'd start uh, worshiping idols, and they they get rid of that one, and then the prophets the prophet would bring in another one, and then he'd start worshiping idols. Even, even David, who was the apple of God's eye and, and sought God's heart, uh, he, he sinned with Bathsheba and, and killed Uriah. Uh, different from others, he repented of his sins and prayed for the Holy Spirit not to be taken from him. But here they, it is demonstrated that they were unwilling to accept the king promised by the Davidic covenant. The Jews knew who Christ was. They, they, as I said, as he's riding in there, they're praising Hosanna to our king. The, the Pharisees knew who he was because they said, you, a mere man, claim to be God. They didn't want to give their power. They didn't want to give up their control. So the next day, Christ heads towards the temple and sees a fig tree, and he compares it to the nation of Israel. And in Mark 11, 12 through 14, he says, and on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Now, several days before Christ, his, his entry as king into Israel, he tells the twelve of what lies ahead. In Mark 10, 32, Christ says, he says, And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests, and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and they shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. You know what always uh, amazed me, and I'm not going to get too much into the death, burial, and resurrection. Michael's going to cover that next week at uh, Resurrection Sunday. But it always amazed me that the, uh, that the apostles weren't there waiting at the tomb. Mm -hmm. Because he said that he would rise again. Mm -hmm. Did you believe him? We're going we're gonna to cover uh, uh, Abraham and Isaac. And we're going to show you how deeply Abraham did believe what God told him. So Christ was full of compliant, full of compliance to the will of the Father. In Mark 14, 32 and 36, it says, And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he saith to his disciples, Sit ye here while I pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, the pillars of the faith, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And saith unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. So here Christ is... is you know, when, when we hear that Christ was fully God, fully man, sometimes we think that his, 
his deity overshadowed his humanity, but they actually existed in perfect existence. Christ suffered and, and bore all the things that we did, except for sin. <laughs> he didn't have any personal sins of his own, as we, as we have, but he bore our sins. They were imputed to him. But he also feared. He also got scared. He also hungered. He also said, I don't know. On certain, on, on a few things, and in speaking from his humanity, that this certain things had not been yet revealed to his humanity. That's hard for us to understand that separation, that 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 coming together, that that fully God, fully man. But then there's certain things that only the only the humanity of Christ it will be dealing with, and his his deity is every place at once, is all knowing. So we don't sometimes understand how the two don't intermix, but God is perfect, and that's not for us to understand completely right now. But here we see in, in the Garden of Gethsemane where Christ, he's, he's, a, he's showing fear of what is the, what's coming. And even ask, you know, if there's any other way for this to be done, let it be done. But, but Father, not my will, yours. So... The book of Mark highlights the humanity of Christ, and in the garden, so we get that picture of him dealing with, the, with fear. How do we deal with fear? Do we, do we allow it to consume us? Or, like Christ, do we stay on plan? Do we stay on God's plan? And that's how we deal with fear. Sometimes you have to ride the storm out instead of bailing the ship. You got to stay on God's plan, and that's what Christ did. He stayed on God's plan. And now we're gonna we're gonna look at a foreshadowing of some of these events. God foreshadowed His triumphant offering of Israel's King and our Savior. God calls out Abraham, and He tells him to sacrifice His son Isaac, the son of promise. Turn with me, if you will, to Genesis 22. One thing I want you to, to uh, recognize is words words mean things. Okay, many people they they brush over certain words in the scripture and everything. Sometimes you got to stop and smell the roses and, and understand the the doctrine that God is including in just sometimes one word or two words of a sentence that he he's he's revealing so much to us. I'm going to point out one or two things here that I want you to, to think about. Okay, so Gen Genesis 22, 1 through 5, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I tell I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. And on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes, and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. This is one of those places right here. We look here. Abraham tells the two that came with him, The lad and I will go off yonder and worship, and we will return and come again to you. He was saying that he and Isaac were going to return. He wasn't saying that I'm taking Isaac on the hill, I'm going to sacrifice him like God told me to, and then I'm going to come back alone. No, Isaac, uh, Abraham was fully confident that God would raise, Isaac, would raise Isaac. Remember, Isaac is the son of promise. He is, he is prom God has promised uh, Abraham that he's going to have descendants numbered as the stars. And he points out that Isaac, your son, 
your only son. Because you remember before, when, God, when Abraham had offered Ishmael, when God was saying he would bless him and that he would create a nation unto him, he said, well, what about Ishmael? And he, God said, no. That is, he is not the son of promise. He is not the son that I promised you. You did that your way. Thought you, you know, you were, that was, what was that one guy? Frank Sinatra, he's saying something, my way. Yeah. <laughs> well, Abraham, when, in, 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 in bringing about Ishmael, that was done in Abraham and Sarah's way, not God's way. And God points out, this is your son, your only son. This is the only son that I recognize. And this is where the promise will come through. So, going up on the hill to sacrifice him, to do what God had tempted him to do, Abraham was fully confident that his son would be coming back down the hill with him. And he sits there and as he tells them, the lad and I will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Words mean things. Okay? So, Abraham is instructed to take his only son to the mountain range of Moriah. This is the same mountain range that years later, Jesus Christ will be sacrificed on the cross at Golgotha. The Hill of Skulls. It's the same area. Okay? Abraham and Isaac willingly go on this journey, gathering the wood and weapon for the sacrifice, while Abraham knows that, Abraham, that Isaac is the sacrifice. Abraham instructs the two men that came with them that he and Isaac will go perform the sacrifice and that they both will return. Abraham was confident that God would resurrect Isaac. He believed what God told him, that he would have the descendants numbered as the stars. Next, go on to verses 6 through 10. And it says, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the, the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Now, exactly what he was doing to Isaac, binding his hands to the altar, is exactly what was to be done to Jesus Christ. And here, Isaac isn't making a sound. He's not, he's not screaming, Father, what are you doing? You're, you're killing. No. He went like a lamb to the shear. Has anybody ever seen lambs sheared here? Mm -hmm. They say that they're dumb because they make no noise going in to be sheared or to be slaughtered. Okay. So Abraham laid the wood upon Isaac, and Isaac carried it up the hill just as Christ would carry his cross up the hill of skulls. When Isaac asked, where is the sacrifice? Abraham answered, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. He just didn't say God will provide a sacrifice. He said God will provide himself a lamb for sacrifice. So he, Jesus Christ, would be producing and, and produce himself as that sacrifice, as that sacrifice for sin that, that justifies us and gives us the grace of salvation. The Bible doesn't record Isaac making protests as he lay on the altar. In Genesis 22, 11 through 16, it says, And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold him, 
a ram caught in a thicket by the horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time, and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. The angel of the Lord is at what's called a Christophany. This is a manifestation of Christ himself. Uh, he, it, the the uh, manifestation of Christ himself. The angel of the Lord tells Abraham that you have not withheld your son from me. And again makes the reference, your only son. God refers to Isaac as the only son. And, and compares him with the son of man, the son of God, the only son of God. So God provides a ram in the bush. Now, what is thicket? Anybody know what thicket is? It's thorns. thorns. Oh. It's thorns. So this ram, this sacrifice that God provides, the temporary sacrifice that he, that he provides, is found with his head stuck in the thicket, in the thorns. Again, a foreshadowing of the crowns being, being put upon Christ. Most of this all is covered in Psalms 22. It's, it's a great, uh, long, but great Psalms. Uh, read it, it, it when, uh, when you get a chance. It, it prophesies much of what Christ goes through on the cross. And that is the verse that Michael will cover next week where Amen. it says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So Christ, Christ came to usher in the kingdom that was promised through the fathers. Through Abraham, God promised a people, a kingdom, and land. And through David, he promised a king. These promises or covenants are to Israel and to Israel alone. In rejecting Christ as the Messiah, Israel's program is put on hold. God introduces the mystery, the plan that God kept hid in himself since eternity past. The nation of Israel rejects rejected Christ as their king and turned Christ over to the Gentiles to be killed. God promised a Savior, the Lamb of God, who would give himself as the sacrifice of sin. We as the body of Christ must only believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And in believing this, we are justified in Christ. We are made right. Not by our works, by the saving grace of Jesus Christ and what he did. And this triumphant entry was the beginning of, of that, that, that week. Now we celebrate Good Friday. I never know why they called it Good Friday. I mean, it's good news for us, of course, but uh, this is where Christ uh, starts, his, his, uh, starts his path of following God's will to secure salvation for us. Uh, so in that, do we have any questions? If not, uh, Michael, you want to close up in prayer? Sure. Oh, Father, we do praise you and thank you this morning for every opportunity to glorify your holy name. Every opportunity, Father, to come together uh, corporately like this to worship you, to adore you, to recognize you, to revel in your word, to take in your word, Father God, to digest it, and to meditate on it all day, every day. What an honor it is to be a member of the body of Christ, to be forgiven, to be cleansed, to be made whole. We just rejoice and we stop and we remember uh, Christ's triumphal entry, Father, and uh, the shouts of Hosanna to the King. And while we no longer know him after the flesh, Father, we know him as the head of the body. And we praise you and thank you again that we are members of that glorious, incredible body. And we look forward to the day that our, our Savior and the head of the body returns for us, that we may be changed into his own glorious body, Father God. We can be changed. And uh, Lord, we're just waiting. We're so excited for that day to take place. Each and every day, Lord, we check the sky. And we look forward to the return of our, uh, of our Lord and our Savior. We praise and thank you now, Father, in the name of Yeshua, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Oh. Oh.
Muchísimo.